Hi, we're Option Conservation, and this is the Shoe Room Sessions. Hello, Rob. Hey, Rich. How Welcome to the Shoe Room. Yeah, thank you. Um, can you tell people out there who you are and what you do? Yeah, so I'm Rob Gardner. I'm now the CEO and co-founder of Rebalance Earth, and we've got one big idea. We think nature is the most valuable asset class on the planet full stop. Uh, but before that, I mean, this is my third entrepreneurial outing. So I really come from the pensions and insurance world. And my kind of guiding North Star has always been financial freedom in a world worth living in. And for the last 25 years, everything I've done has really been about financial freedom, helping people be better with money. Uh, and really two years ago, I decided to focus much more on a world worth living in. I think we can all agree that that's the most important thing. Um, you have the most fascinating career. Take me through that contents page, Rob. Take me back from childhood to education through to getting us here. And, and don't skip through because it's amazing. I want the listeners to hear it. So. Yeah, so actually my, my parents are both teachers and I was, I was born in Holland. And I suppose the important link there is I was born below sea level. And so even as a toddler, I was kind of aware of sea level rising. And this, yeah, this is back in 1978. So this is a long time, a long time ago. And, and Holland is always been up there on thinking more about the environment, everything from recycling and double, triple glazing. Uh, so even from a very young age, I was kind of acutely aware of this kind of idea that sea levels might rise and that's not going to be uh, a, a good thing. And then my parents taught all over uh, and in the 80s, we moved to Argentina. Now, people may or may not know this, but in 82, there was a war between the UK and Argentina. So being a British family and moving to Argentina in 1985 wasn't the most obvious move to do with your family. Uh, and, you know, there was why they made that choice. I think, I mean, they, my, my mum and dad love to travel. Uh, and they, I mean, they've, they've worked in some amazing countries all over the world. Uh, they, literally, they were looking through the Times Educational Supplement, saw this job at St. Andrew's Scott School, Buenos Aires, and thought, right, well, it's our family over... Uh, our entire family over to Buenos Aires. Uh, and look, Buenos Aires in the 80s was dangerous. It was like Johannesburg. Uh, I mean, at school, I'd say someone in my class, his parents or family would be murdered at least once a year. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the big thing, unfortunately, I mean, Argentina is the most incredible country from a, a landscape and a geography perspective, but it's probably one of the you know, the saddest stories of the last hundred years, because back in the early 20th century, it was an incredibly successful economy. And politically, it's had so much carnage from the 1980s. And, you know, more recently now, we've got a new premier who's an interesting chap, so, so to say. But, you know, we experienced devaluation, inflation. Inflation was running at 30% a month. And my experience of school was at the end of each month, we'd go out, and we get our hair cut, we buy new clothes. You go to the supermarket, and this was the days when you put price stickers on, and we do supermarket sweep. And the idea was to get around the supermarket as quickly as possible and grab stuff. You could buy milk at the morning's price rather than the afternoon's price. You just paid the morning's price. So this was my experience. And then at night, we would drive up to this house, which looked like a house out of narcos, big, metal bars, Dobermans, we'd all sit in the car. My dad would go into this house with a wad of Australs or pesos or whatever the currency was at that point in time, and then walk out with a much smaller wad of US dollars. We then come back home and we roll those US dollars up and put them in the old 35 millimeter canisters. Some of your employees will have no idea what I'm talking about, uh, but the old, you remember 35 millimeters, and then we'd hide them around the house. And that's because putting your money in the bank was not the safest place to be. This all links to my passion for financial freedom and teaching people about money because I just saw how hard my mum and dad worked. But actually there in Argentina, it was inflation could just take your money away. And if you didn't do that, can you imagine if at the end of the month he had 30% less money because of inflation? Just compounding away. My dad's salary couldn't buy one stamp four years later. So that is how bad inflation was. And I just kind of grew up in this world. And in Argentina, you only had two terms. So you just had this three month long summer holiday. 
And we would go traveling all over South America. So we'd go down to Ushuaia. We would go, I remember going and uh, we were in Patagonia and David Attenborough was there and filming The Trials of Life, the first one in the 1990s. Uh, I did the Inca Trail when I was like eight years old. Peru was a dangerous place at that time. There's El Sindino Luminoso, which is kind of like this, uh, the shining path. Uh, you know, there was nothing like the Peru you would, that anyone would, who would go today. Uh, and I knew every currency's exchange rate to the US dollar at age eight. And the link there is my first job was in finance at Deutsche Bank. Uh, and I've always had a love for currencies and, and money and had a, just a really intuitive sense of how much work do I need to do that? And what can that buy me in this currency? And just whilst we're still on the Argentina point, uh, Argentina has a lot of very poor people, no middle class, and then just a handful of like super wealthy. And so really the school we were at was the school for expats or the super wealthy. And we were this kind of non-existent middle class. We were nothing like the rest of the kids. We were nothing like the 99% of Argent Argentinians. Uh, and so I used to watch the older boys and girls and they'd have their Coca-Cola and Fanta bottles and they'd just leave it. But you just collect up the old bottles and then go and take it and then you get money. So from a very young age, I used to get money and I've got, uh, I've got a book, actually I've got a copy, which I'll give you afterwards, but, uh, my kind of catchphrase is earn it, keep it and grow it. And so from Argentina, I learned two things, earn it, you know, my parents work hard and that's a really important value for me, but actually I could see opportunity. There's opportunities everywhere. There's Coca-Cola bottles, Fanta bottles. That was a circular economy back then. Yeah, right? absolutely. You know what? I mean, I, I'm a big fan of, I'm at m &S are about to reintroduce that, which is a great thing. Uh, but, you know, one of the things I try and tell people is there's opportunities to earn money everywhere. The number of eBay millionaires that sprung up during lockdown is, is, is amazing. But the second thing is the art of keeping hold of your money. In, in the case of Argentina, it was inflation. And, you know, the inflation we've experienced in the UK over the last 18 months is nothing uh, like the inflation that we had there. Then I came back. Wait, wait, just from leave Argentina. Really interesting. So you saw that disparity between people that were struggling financially to get by and the uber wealthy. I think it's interesting. Some people see the uber wealthy and they project hatred and anger towards them and think, well, that's totally unfair. I can, I can never be there. And what was it about you that kind of, but if I'm hearing it right, didn't find that inspirational, nor did you find it problematic. You just looked to find opportunity in that. Yeah. I, you know, it, it, it's funny. I, although I did come back and my parents taught at a, a very posh prep school here in the UK where I did feel a little bit more like Downton Abbey and I felt a little bit more like I was definitely the downstairs. Right. Okay. Uh, whereas I never, I was never made to feel like that. I think I was an interesting alien, you know, this English boy in Argentina. So in a way that made it quite unique, it, it classless, if that yeah. makes sense. So I, you're right. It had neither a positive or a negative, uh, impact on me when I was a little bit older and back here in the UK and I had more of that upstairs downstairs feeling i i did have a bit for a long time in the beginning of my career a chip on my shoulder I'm like i'm going to prove you i'm going to go and earn money and i you know I, you know my tennis racket would be from the second hand you know i had high tech trainers or green flash and you know you, so i had that chip on my shoulder that i wasn't like the other kids it's a chip i carry at, no well yeah. at, at, at the school so it took me a long time to get rid of that that chip and that definitely motivated me in the first five years of, of my I career. think the chip's way more healthy than the resentment is. So some people see that disparity and go, I can never get there, that's terrible. Others see it and think, what can I do? Where is my opportunity? As we as we move through, I think the entrepreneurial bit's gonna be a key theme for, for your career, but you could already see that eight years old, right? The way you were looking for opportunities and things. And when I look back now, it's, it's not quite as aligned to the financial world, but even when I was washing pots in a hotel, kitchen i was always trying to stack it in the most efficient way to make it clean i was there was no benefit to doing it better or perform but my brain just couldn't not give me a way of how can i improve this process and system and try and make it better well on the entrepreneurial thing you just reminded me so I, my parents moved back to the uk and then they taught in saudi and all over the middle east and at that point once you were over the age of 13 you couldn't go to school in the middle east and this is after the first gulf war uh, so they, they picked their times to move. Yeah, yeah, no, they did. No, no, they definitely, they weren't there during the first Gulf War, but they moved for a short, basically very shortly afterwards. 
uh, and I went to school in 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 Bristol. Uh, but I used to so in Saudi you couldn't drink, but everyone used to brew their own alcohol. So I got all the recipes for what's called Jeddah gin, and then I convinced the kitchen staff at my school to brew this stuff for me. And the old, if you remember at school, like the the, the big things of squash, yeah, like industrial canisters of squash. I used to then get them to brew it for me and then stick it up in the pipes. And then oh, no, you were sweet. I know. I don't know how, because I mean, that's such a sackable offense. I mean, basically they were taking, I wasn't paying them. I didn't pay them. And yeah, and they could have lost their jobs. And then I used to, yeah, go to Sainsbury's, buy Cresta lemonade and then cut it and, and, and sell it. And the other thing I used to do was buy fags at Saudi, because you could buy like, a, a, yeah, at the time I think fags were like £2.50 in the UK and you could buy Marlboro Light, Marlboro for 20p, 40p. So I used to like go and visit my mum and dad in Saudi and then come back with a caseload of Camel cigarettes and, and Marlboro and then sell it. And then I would use that to fund my you just still going out, <laughs> yeah, my <laughs> distillery, my Jenna Gin. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, from a very, yeah, for my whole life, I've always had this kind of itch to, to kind of make make money but not and re really just to kind of enable me to do the things i want to do not, it, that was just a really fun being able to go out with you know my mates and go to the pub or buy clothes or... but it sounds like then it was it was the solving the problem and the the creative bit even more so than the tokens of purchase it gave you oh uh, yeah no yeah big time I'd, yeah and and obviously with it there was a bit of kudos to to that as well I, yeah it it wasn't it wasn't about generating the money you're right uh it, yeah I, I did definitely enjoy kind of thinking, okay, how am I going to, uh, it felt a bit raw Dalesque. How am I going to convince these people to allow me to brew the booze? And then how am I going to get it out? Uh, love it. Love it. Okay. So, so keep moving us forward through education. So, uh, I'm about to do maths, physics, chemistry, cause that's what my mum and dad both did. And, my and were you interested in those? Or it's just what you were supposed to do. I was good at maths. Yeah. Uh, I was good at physics. I didn't particularly enjoy them. My mum and dad, had, you know, it's just kind of, that's what my parents did. That's what I was good at. But by that age, I think I'd visited like 35 different countries. I traveled to most countries in South America, uh, loved glaciers. That's my kind of the, the thing I, you know, I really, really love. And the geography teacher convinced me to do geography and I ended up taking geography and then dropping chemistry. And then he then convinced me to apply to do geography at university. And I still remember him now, Tim Clements. And he said, uh, and Mrs. Lawrence are saying, hey, you just got to pick a subject you love. Don't worry about, you know, you had the careers. I don't know if you remember those kind of like careers. <laughs> you take it and tell you, you could be an accountant or an actuary. And you're like, I just wanted to be a lawyer. So I, so I just answered it so that it'd say lawyer. <laughs> I just cheat the system so it gives you the answer you want. Then I realized I didn't actually want to be a lawyer. I was just really into Ali McBeal, the TV program that was yeah. on when I was a teenager. Yeah. Yeah. Ali McBeal. Yeah. Well, so yeah, studied geography and, and really that whereabouts at Oxford. Very lucky because uh, then within that, you can then specialize into human and physical. And, and the bit that I enjoyed the most was really hydrology and glaciology. And then I became part of the Alpine Glacier Project, which has been going for 50 years and students from various universities around the UK would go out to Switzerland and then drill boreholes, sediment data, the full works and, and just all of the joy of being on a field trip, you know, camping, having to play rock, paper, scissors, decide who's going to walk two hours down the mountain to go to the supermarket and buy the food and the beer to walk back up and then who's going to go up and collect the data from the, from the weather station. So yeah, that, 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 that was an incredible experience. And th the other thing about Oxford is that you just have an incredible milk round and I'd never heard of investment banks. I'd heard of HSBC and Barclays, but I never heard of Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley or, or, or Merrill Lynch. And so I used to famously amongst all my friends, I'd have a, the careers chart. I, I did the opposite of you. I knew I definitely didn't want to be a lawyer. So I go to all the lawyers events because I knew that I didn't want that job and basically just go for all the free food and the booze. The best were always Unilever and Procter and Gamble because you'd then walk away with like shampoo, washing up liquid, ice cream, like the full world. Where's the opportunity? There's oh yeah, exactly. Where's the opportunity? And then ended up doing an internship with Deutsche Bank, uh, 
and then ended up joining the, the graduate program and, and started my career. What was that internship like? Was that full-on ferocious type of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean... Talk about that culture. It's it's funny, actually, and I've been I've been reflecting on it uh, because in the, 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 the world that we live in today, which is kind of like full-on ESG quite well this is this was definitely you know would fail on a number of areas and it was at the end of the 90s deutsche bank at the time had just bought uh bankers trust deutsche morgan grenfell and it was this kind of european continental bank which wanted to be the number one and when i joined it became number one in fx globally and knocked off city and, and and ubs and just had huge ambition. And I always remember my one of my bosses, Martin Belvisi, he said, Rich, at Deutsche Bank, we're part Doberman, part piranha. And he had like a dried piranha on the top of his desk. So this is, this is, by the way, you can actually see his piranha on the top of his desk in the 2000 graduate recruitment video. So he lives his, <laughs> so part Doberman, part piranha. And I, I remember in the 2001 census, I was living with two of my mates who I'd studied geography with. One was working for EY and one was working for Pricewaterhouse. I was doing a hundred hours a week. I was doing more than the two of them put together. I used to get in at 6.30 and I'd be there until like 9.30 at night. In fact, if you weren't at your desk at 9.30, my boss would call up and he'd be like, Bobo, is that you, Bobo? And they go, yeah, uh, hey Pandor. Uh, he goes, where's Euro Swissy six month vault? And if you didn't know it like that, you'd be like, Bobo, you're lower than whale shit at the bottom of the ocean. That was always his, I mean, now it's funny, but you know, when you're 22, when there's some big MD says you're lower than whale shit at the bottom of the ocean, you're like, okay, I know, I know where I sit in, 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 in the world. At the end of the year, get me a big fat bonus and then topped it up with everything else. He was, he was tough on his people but whenever the big big boss came back you'd always be like Andrew Andrew come over me Rob he's a man. so very strange uh but, it's, but in some ways I kind of missed that that it was a meritocracy so I was 22 it didn't matter if you were 22 32 or 42 if you were doing a job better than the next person then you were you were so at like 24 I remember I had some guy who ended up working for me at 24 and he was just yeah you can imagine he had all the MBAs and uh and I think you and I probably feel the same way about MBAs moderate but average but uh uh <laughs> yeah I forgot I forgot you uh can see well you didn't do an MBA so you're okay and James uh, is behind the camera and there's a famous story if you listen to James's podcast about how he went back to do a master's and I shouted out on uh on a podcast I did that he should have just watched YouTube instead but that's that's by the by so but but yeah, that's what I that's what I loved about it, and I learned so much. Uh, I'm so I'm so envious of that experience in some way. So so I didn't have that. Mine uh, my exposure to growing up, it was like can't talk about money. It's not a thing. Um, my my parents were the exact opposite of yours by the sounds of it. Didn't want to leave the small town they were from. Don't have ideas. Don't have ambitions. You know, literally going into business was just didn't didn't even know it existed. Didn't even know banks existed really. So, but my version of that apprenticeship was in the sporting world. So, whereas that sort of level of abuse was there, but physical as well. So that same immediate, it's not good enough feedback was you're on your backside, get up and bigger American guys played American football. If you weren't training hard enough, no one had to tell you, you found out pretty damn fast. And I think that was so character building and the amount of failing so much through sport earlier and we, we toured America in 2006 and I was the shortest person in my position by a foot. I looked like the mascot when we went out to, so I was captain. So I went out to shake hands at the start. I looked like someone's little brother, the mascot. And the only reason they made me captain was because I outworked everyone else because I had no choice. I was the worst athlete on the team. I had to outwork everybody else. And that was my version of the character building type of setup uh, that, that you described, I think. But I think if we hadn't had that sort of incredibly challenging demanding selection process i wouldn't be where i am today i don't know if you feel like you would yeah well so i mean this has got why well, you kind of reflect back and go is this good or bad have we got you know and, and I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of radical candor and you know and i know you feel i feel, feel the same way but not everyone likes uh radical candor i mean you got radical i mean at times it was definitely abusive and bullying yeah. so there's definitely a line 
Uh, but but I, I do believe, especially in the early part of your career, you want to work your butt off. The, the thing is, though, if you did work your butt off, you did get tra- in the quiet moments in between. And James, you talk about, you know, being able to listen into calls and all the rest. That's when you learn and you earned the trust by getting everyone's coffees, by getting everyone's lunch and not screwing it up. You and you think it's a, right. fin- yeah. you think it's a menial task. It is a bit hazing. But actually, they're saying, "Can you pay attention to detail? Can you not fuck it up? Can we get? Can do we know that you're going to get this thing right?" The quid pro quo is when it's a little bit dark, you know, a little bit quiet on the desk. They're going to sit down and they're going to tell you, "Well, this is why we did this, or this is how we did that," and 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 you build, you know, you build that, you build that trust. And the other thing is, yeah, you, know, you don't realize it, but 25 years later, these people are all, you know, some of these people that I used to work with can potentially now help me out. In, in my in my new world uh, and, and and my new ventures and that's one of the things I think when you start your career you cannot imagine no. that you're going to be working with someone who that relationship you might be valuable to them or vice versa 20, 20 and you years know the lesson you're learning at the time so um, I remember so I worked on building sites and in oil refineries and steel works and I once spent an entire summer scraping oil off railway lines at steel works on my hands and knees for like six weeks straight and this was during university and and it was horrific but i think now it's the it's why i have the ability to speak politely to a very manual workforce and also can go into a boardroom which at various points in my career has been really useful you don't realize you're learning those lessons at the time and i find it now i'm like oh god that thing i was doing then i'm applying now so for young people out there make the tea make the coffee don't be bullied or abused but if you get asked to do something hard just do it with a smile and and take the opportunity in it and, and to complete that loop so james is sat in the room and james was the person who would benefit the most from spending some time with you and learning about your career so we asked james to help you with your travel arrangements yeah it wasn't an accident he had the right to to get that so yeah compete well he he would have liked uh so excel like, having geography a there was i was probably the only geographer who got into finance uh and I was like quite saluting. Most people were LSE, finance, economics. Yeah. Like what on earth is a geographer doing here? I didn't know anything about finance or bootstrapping or your curves or Excel. But basically, if you ever use the mouse when you're using Excel, you feel like, <laughs> it's like, no, no. Like you, you had to like play Excel like it was a piano and no, I mean, I can, I, I was just listening to you. I was thinking, uh, there's Jay, you, you talk about loving Excel and you would have loved it. I, I hated it. I didn't know anything about Excel. Everyone else had all done Excel as part of their finance course. Uh, and I had to teach myself. But yeah, if you were ever caught using the mouse because you didn't know the shortcuts, that was just a massive fine or a repuse uh, for doing that. So that's always an extra incentive to learn. For avoidance of doubt, no one beats James to the best <laughs> of my knowledge for using a mouse. Does Chris beat you for that? <laughs> okay. but but you do you do learn the, the the thing is though that the upside was there i mean i've been reading arnold schwarzenegger's book uh be useful uh which is superb and i i share so much of his kind of perspective about you know basically work your ass off yeah uh but the, the, he does make the point though there needs to be upside and so it's not all it's not clear to me that when you were cleaning oil off the railway tracks there was much upside there was a lot of upside for me at the, interesting, the upside of that was it was the only way uh, so so i lived in in north lincolnshire and the humber bridge used to have these really expensive bridge toll tickets to get across and my now wife lived on the other side of the bridge so it was literally an hour of scraping oil off a railway line allowed me to go see my now wife Oh, no, that's, that was the exchange rate mechanism then. Well, a good, a very valuable one. Good investment. Thank you, Helen. Yeah, very good investment. So, yeah, so worked in finance. Then I got headhunted by my my, business, my first business partner, Dawid. Uh, and, and that was pretty special because I went to go work at Merrill Lynch and that was my introduction to pensions. And how did that approach? So headhunted, what does that look like for people? I mean, in, in financial services, you have an entire industry of people who are literally called headhunters, whose job it is to call up people at other jobs elsewhere and say, there's a job over here. Do you want to come and take, take that job? It's an interesting world because on the one hand, if you're recruiting, it's a great way to get good talent. Uh, at the same time, if you have a team and you have talented people and someone gets headhunted in a way, it's, it's, it's a nightmare. And also if you're a candidate, it's you know the headhunters really looking after themselves. It's a commission based, yeah. uh, a commission based business. But yeah, there I was like 24, 25 and you know getting calls from headhunters. It does make you feel a little bit 
it makes you a bit special actually you realize pro business that, athlete right yeah exactly uh every, everyone gets those uh those calls but no it was in 2003 uh, and actually it was just because i'd had a change of boss at deutsche bank and actually i had a one of those kind of sliding door moments i could have gone and worked in the oil and commodities trading so i was considering becoming an oil trader this was uh, i would say in in 2002 uh, I'm going to hold it against you. Yeah, okay. but I, I did, I did briefly, seriously consider becoming a, a, an, an oil trader, uh, or, or leaving and joining Merrill Lynch and, and working with uh, with Dowd and working on trying to help pension funds and uh, and obviously being sort of 24, 25, telling people you work in pensions isn't you know it's not the most exciting dynamic uh, intro, but no, I loved it and I, I suppose it suited me. I'm a very long term person. I like solving long-term complicated problems. And then in 2003, we pioneered a way of uh, pension funds managing their risk. We completely changed the way pension funds not only think about their assets, which is what they really focused on, but also their liabilities to pay these pensioners uh, for the next 100 years. It was 2003, and people who work in pensions tend to be kind of actuaries. So we were these two outsiders can you explain to people what actuaries are? Yeah. This uh, so an actuary is typically someone who's incredibly good at maths, insanely good at maths, and their job is normally to estimate when people will die. There are other things, you know, likelihood of, in, of a car crashes. So you have actuaries in the insurance industry and the pensions industry, and it's really the law of large numbers and how long people might live. And if, if people think about sort of like Scottish widows, the, the sort of pensions and insurance industry really came from kind of Scotland. But this idea that how can I insure a thousand people's lives or a million people's lives, pull that together. And if someone dies early, then that money can be used to fund someone who lives a long time. Uh, so it goes back a long time pre sort of computer modeling. And in fact, the first company we founded Reddington is named after Frank Reddington, who is arguably the world's most famous actuary. So if you enter the geeky world of Benton's investment, Frank Reddington is arguably the world's greatest actuary, the goat of actuaries. And we founded Reddington on what would have been his 100th, 100th birthday. And he was the chief actuary for Prudential in the 1950s and came up with all of these, all of these models. So we weren't actuaries. Uh, and we came in and, as outsiders and said, well, there has to be a better way to manage these assets and liabilities. And uh, pension funds used to spend all of their time looking at their assets, how have they done, what's gone up, what's gone down, how should we change over the next three years? And then once every three years, they'd look at the liability side, which is how many members do we have to pay? How long might they all live? What cash flows do we use? And they weren't really managing the two against each other. Uh, and we kind of came and said, well, that doesn't make any sense. You need to look at what makes your liabilities go up and down and what makes your assets go up and down and can you make those mirror each other a little bit more and obviously you want to make your assets grow 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 faster than that uh so that was kind of the the approach that that that, that we came in and and I, I suppose our core idea was that you could actually use derivatives to manage this super long dated interest rate and inflation risk but still remain invested in equities and bonds can you explain to people what derivatives are yeah so Normally we buy physical things, a house uh, or coffee or uh, petrol. Uh, a derivative is a contract, uh, people gamble or bet, it, effectively that's a derivative where we can enter into a contract where we can say, I will buy your coffee beans off you at this price in the future. Now obviously if the price is higher, I've made money because I bought it at a price that we've already agreed and the price has gone up. But conversely, if the price falls, then you've made money. Now, derivatives are very helpful because if you're a producer, you can kind of lock in your costs, uh, but also people use it to to speculate as well. So de derivatives are kind of an interesting, interesting idea. And what, what people outside of financial services won't know is if you took all of the stock of all of the physical things you buy and sell, bonds and equities, the derivatives market is way, way bigger. And that's probably the bit that people don't really understand about the kind of global financial crisis. And people sort of talk about shadow banking, that there are all these other financial instruments that kind of sit behind the scenes uh, that are way bigger than the, 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 than the sort of physical things that, that, that people buy and, buy and sell. 
in this case, those derivatives were being used to manage risk. So pension funds were saying, well, I want to lock in that inflation risk because I don't know what inflation will be and, 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 and how to pay that out. So we kind of changed the way pension funds think about a managed risk in 2003. Uh, and then in, and at the time, I became the youngest director ever at Merrill Lynch. And then literally in March 2006, uh, I retired, age 27. And that's because it allowed me to keep my shares. Uh, and we, we set up Reddington. And to you do that. What was it that allowed you to achieve that at that age? Was it technical ability? Was it your relationships within the business? How did you do that? It's a really an excellent question. Uh, so we had a team and we had two people on the team who were super technical. I would say both Dowd and I are kind of babel fish in that we are we could speak to business people and frame and contextualize the problem. And then we could go back to base and speak to incredibly smart people and understand about 50% of what they'd say and have the confidence to say, I don't understand what you're saying and sort of act as the sort of translation mechanism back. I think linked to that, my first boss, the one who used to the describe me runner. as, no, 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 the one who was like, you're lower than well shit at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, in spring, I used to put out our best ideas these were derivative ideas so highly esoteric but i used to do it as a fashion magazine this guy was a uh, uh sort of he was actually from malta but he sort of saw him sort of more italian flamboyant gay guy but in the early 2000s investment banking you didn't get many flamboyantly openly gay men uh and i used to put what was this quite boring collection of derivative ideas together but i made it into like a fashion magazine uh and I think the importance of framing it and making it accessible is is a really is a really key skill. And one of the there were two books that Dowd and I read at the time that helped us make that move. Uh, and uh, I'd recommend now one is quite dated. Uh, first one was Thomas Friedman's "The World Is Flat," and he was basically talking about how everything had now changed. Uh, this was in the internet era, so pre-social media, but people could use blogs. People could now outsource accountancy to India. And so all of the conversations we're having now about AI was really about outsourcing and how you can use the internet to do things cheap, cheap around the world. But the world is flat, i.e. you can kind of get anything from anywhere at, at a much lower cost. And what does that do to sort of change the world? And so that kind of means, well, actually, I don't need to be part of a big Merrill Lynch to do things and and that that's even more true today right i mean what i can do with my iphone and ai just blows my mind uh and then the the second one uh was the tipping point malcolm gladwell's first book and in it he talks about people who the, the tipping point is how do you create change and he talks about these sort of three three skill sets uh one is a a maven someone who has deep deep technical expertise neither Darren nor i were mavens although we did have mavens working for us and we then hired those mavens to come and join us at, at, at reddington but there are people who have above average social connectivity and the test is you get a yellow pages and you read through it and you just have to underline how many people you know with that name and depending on how old you are and there's a function normally of race or, or background you can still say you'd expect to know that many people. But there were connectors who will just have like 5X that and 10X that. And I remember working in investment banking and I'd look around and the most successful people were never the ones who were the brightest or the smart. They were the ones who had the best relationships as in either externally or internally. Uh, and then obviously linked with that is also kind of communication skills, you know, the ability to kind of frame something and make it accessible. Persuade someone to make gin for you. Persuade someone to make cheddar gin. It wasn't even gin, yeah. I mean, it was god awful stuff, but yeah. Turning up at the legal events at university when you just wanted a feed, but you would have had to have worked a room to do that. So those skills that allowed you to be the youngest director of Merrill Lynch, you were picking up at each of those different chapters along the way? Yeah, no, I mean, 100%. Uh, the, and look, I, you know, at the time I was sort of 27 and my clients were sort of 45 or 50. So trying to convince people to build that trust and obviously you do need to be good so that's why you do need to work hard you need to know your you need to know your subject matter expert and i think you need to 
know an awful lot, but then you can still augment that with someone on your team who like really, really yeah. uh, know, always hire people better than you. No, no, knows no, knows the details. Uh, but yeah, basically, Dad and I were like, you know what? Because the, we had to then go and convince the investment consultants that this was a better way of doing it, and there were all these barriers you could put up, and you just greedy investment bankers, and you know, and so we're like, you know what? Let's let's turn up and show them how it's done and you know so we founded reddington we literally founded it out of my spare bedroom in my in my flat I was in north london at the time and that was attic and even today in reddington's office there's a meeting room called uh rob's kitchen uh and that was attic uh in in sort of remembrance of of that and a couple of our first staff were kind of hard into <laughs> into my kitchen i probably had my washing dry on the side and there'd be a laptop on the kitchen table uh and yeah, and that's and that's how we started Reddington. Actually, our first client uh, was the Royal Mail back in, in back in two thousand and six. And I'm forever grateful to Frank Chanella, who was the financial director of Royal Mail at the time. And he he could have hired Barclays or Roster, so he had like investment banks, or he could have hired PwC, Mercer, Aon Hewitt, uh, and he hired us. Did you ever ask him why? Well, well he said, well, because. He he saw that we had the skills that he could see in the investment bank that from the Barclays and all the rest, we were as good as them. Because literally just a month earlier, we'd been at Merrill Lynch. Yeah. So we were kind of like first amongst equals with, with them, but suddenly we were in this kind of deconflicted. The problem with the banks is they're in a conflicted business model. And we're in this kind of deconflicted business model. And I'm guessing the thing about the, the work ethic of bankers, I mean, there are lots of sort of positives and negatives, but typically the work ethic is like super super high so he's kind of getting all of that which is what he felt he needed but without any of the negatives and then he then he took our contract and he crossed out reddington and he wrote in robert gardner and david kanochi and he said i've done you a favor he says your job is to make sure that your next client hires reddington not you guys because i'm hiring you guys and that's a really important lesson because you know we called the business reddington after frank reddington not Gardner Canote Hulu or Price Waterhouse Coopers because a Gardner Canote Hulu sounds, sounds very weird, uh, but B I think you know you need to build a brand that lives beyond beyond you and you can hand over and both Dowd and I very much into kind of this idea of thinking hundred years ancestors and 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 handing it on. And that taught me two lessons. A, build a team and get people to hire Team Reddington, hire Reddington, so it wasn't hiring us. And then the second thing as you start to build and grow your business is you, know, you need to diversify your, re your revenue. For, you can't have all your eggs in one basket. You can't have all, you can have an amazing contract and many businesses get into trouble because they have an amazing client for a long, long time. And then one day that client goes and that entire business can 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 unravel so yeah i'm very grateful to to frank a for hiring us and sticking his neck out uh b for crossing out our contracts uh which then forced us to make two really good business decisions nice so um take us to the uh you departing reddington yeah so this so that was 2006 built built reddington up i mean there were so many lessons learned all the different phases and i think you've probably read a book by 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 daniel Priestley, and i don't know if you remember the bit where he talks about crossing the desert but have definitely sort of crossed the desert and and you know our goal was always to build a high performance team we we had a really nice boutique business we could have stopped at about 12 15 18 people had a really nice little boutique business we were way more profitable then than a long time later. Did, did you feel you were in a special time then when you had those? Were you sort of present enough to be like, this is nice and cool and I like it? Uh, there, there was a, a sweet spot time. I think, unfortunately, it was very close to the global financial crisis. So, uh, and at the time, our cash flow variability wasn't sorted. So a few years later, one of the best things we did is we moved to these kind of fixed term inflation linked contracts. Because the big issue that we had was what I called the wall of death, which is I could forecast my revenues three months out. And then as we hired more people and we got bigger and bigger, our costs were going up. So I was 
let's say our costs were five hundred thousand pound a month, I I could see three months out and it'd be like eight hundred thousand, eight hundred thousand, eight hundred thousand, and then it would drop to a hundred thousand. So you've got a four hundred thousand pound shortfall. And people come to me and say, oh, hey, I've got engaged and I want to get out of mortgage. I just want to check, you know, how's the business? Am I going to get my bonus at the end of the year? I'm thinking, I'm not sure where you're going to I'm even pay you at the end of the year. And nothing to do with their performance or, or all the rest, but just to do with the kind of the shape of the, the financial shape of the business. And so that the, the responsibility of paying people's wages and knowing that people are kind of making big life decisions, getting married, take out mortgages, that, that was kind of a big weight to carry around my neck, especially, you know, I was probably like 29 or, or, or 30 at the time. So I probably didn't enjoy it as much, as much as I did. It wasn't until you got to the end of the year, you go, oh, actually, that was an okay year. We did quite well. Cause at every point in that year, you just like, it's like being in an ice bath. It's not nice <laughs> until you get out. Exactly. Exactly. That's a good analogy. Uh, so, so that was that, but, you know, fast forward, uh, you know, Reddington's now a, a big, a big business, uh, or a decent sized SME. We founded another business along the way, Mallow Street. Uh, and then about five years ago, uh, we were looking actually before that we were looking to raise money in Reddington. And then again, the big question when we were letting private equity companies in was, can we invest in this business without you and Dowd in it, i.e. to what extent is the success of this business dependent on you two versus dependent on Reddington, the culture, the people, uh, prove to us that this business can make money without you in it. So ironically, at that point in time, the business was worth more with us out of it than in it because it was basically a big discount because people were like well i don't know what the uncertainty is so it was almost like we had to prove that yeah well actually no we've got a great team they can go and win business when you when you were first asked that question what was your honest answer was your honest answer well no it's not going to be as good without me in it or were you at the point then when you were like, actually no i can walk away well well i think both are true uh I mean, I, you know, I would, I would, I wouldn't say this because it's kind of my baby, mm -hmm. but you always think that, y you know, you, if it's you, you do it in a different way. What, what we had done is we had made it so it could run without us. That, that for sure we had. I, I always remember someone saying, you've not got the right team and systems in place. If you can't go on holiday and turn your email and your laptop off or your black pre at the time. If you're still having to check your email and all the rest, then you haven't got the right system culture processes in place. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that was, that was hard. And actually that was hard on, on my marriage in the early, you know, in the early part of our marriage in terms of like, how do you, how do you make that, how do you make that work? But we had, by that point, we had got it, but it's fair to say that on the selling side of the business, so on the running 100%, but on the selling side of the business, that was definitely probably mine and David's strength. Okay. So how did you demonstrate that it could run without you? Well, I ended up stepping back. So I still own shares in Reddington. Yeah. It's still part of my, you know, uh, as I say, I'm still the co-founder and, and part owner of that business, but I ended up joining the executive board of St. James's place. So at the same time I was in this weird situation where I had all my money and wealth tied up in the Valley of Reddington. And I was paying myself out of, so I was in this sort of catch 22. So I needed another job because I didn't have my, my financial security was wrapped up in there. Yeah. So I needed another job to go to. I couldn't just sort of like step back and go, okay, right. Run it. It's incredibly strange. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I just happened to get, uh, again, sort of headhunted because the person who I replaced, uh, knew me and said, oh, by the way, confidentially, I'm going to be retiring. And I'm, you know, we're looking for my successor and we're running a process. And had you worked closely with St. James's Place before? Yeah, they were, they were a client of Reddington. Okay. So Reddington did, had, had done some work. Well, it has featured a lot across shoot room sessions of people talking about those career changes and, and certainly having those existing relationships is, well, it's what you said before, the social connectivity, right? It's so important in business. Yeah. And I mean, James said on the, the podcast, but you know, it, it kind of 75% of jobs you, you don't know about, or you might know about it and there might be a process. But they'll typically be sort of preferred candidates in that process, yep. uh, at, you know, as a result of that. So it all kind of in, in 2018, 
we'd had this feedback by the way when you go to private equity you you you, you show your your firm your reddington which is your kind of baby and and obviously like all parents you think your baby's beautiful they tell you it's not right yeah they're, they're, if you, i mean you're a big fan of feedback you get it's some pretty brutal, radical uh, feedback about, yeah, your baby is beautiful, but, 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 but. And yeah, yeah uh, that was hard to hear the first time. But again, you learn so much from, you, you become, and, and actually there's an interesting lesson in that because I, I kind of think about Reddington, the founder, Reddington being the CEO, key, co-CEO, and now Reddington, the investor. And your your roles in each one of those is different. But in the beginning, you're all three at once. Yes. So as I kind of gone through, you've sort of almost like untangled, uh, un untangled those. Well, and you've worn a lot more hats along the way. So my, my experience of founding OC with with Auction House is, so we have 25 people now. Say, I've done most of those jobs from day one because it was me and Dan that that started it. So we we look at uh, when we we buy a new estate, we produce an acquisition paper, and each time it gets better because I would have written nine out of the ten sections. And each time we did a new acquisition, a professional national leading expert in that field's come in. Suddenly that section's amazing. And the last one we looked at, I, I didn't write a solo section. I uh, contributed to a vision statement, reviewed the piece, and it's night and day from where it was. So, you know, I've done 20 roles and now there's 25 people better than me doing those jobs. Yeah, and that's the great thing about a business. It compounds up, right? You compound up the intellectual capital and capability of the business. So like the, the surface area of what you can do as a business just... And that's what I think people in Reddington didn't understand. I was sharing with someone recently, uh, it was in 2014, I'd done a vision and strategy piece. And I was saying by 2024, we'll be making 24, 25 million a year. We'll be making four or 5 million pound profit. They looked at me like I was crazy. Uh, and then 10 years later, did it. If people, um, when you, when you talk about your goals, there was a quote, isn't there? That if people don't think you're crazy, they're not big enough. Yeah. So how many people are there now? I'm at about 200. Yeah. That's pretty cool, right? To have founded that and for it to be where it is now. Yeah. Yeah. And and actually there's a business that's spun out in China called YYT that I'm now set on the board on. So the guy who's the CEO of that business, he was the first person I hired, a guy called Stephen Yang Yu. Uh, and now he runs this like cool little, I say little business in, in China, basically does all the ALM software for some of the biggest insurance companies in China, which happened to be some of the biggest insurance companies in the world. The beautiful thing there is the team are behind camera going, which one of us is going to spit out first? <laughs> and, and where, which is which is amazing. Uh, so talk briefly about your, your period with St. James Place. What was that like from it being your business and your baby to being in someone else's world? Yeah, so I, I think one of the reasons, I mean, you talked about uh, sport being where you kind of got that, that feedback. I thought, okay, I've built a business with my co-partner from the ground up. We'd set up an an amazing culture in in in, in Reddington, very purpose led. I, you know, our goal at Reddington is, you know, how can we help make a hundred million people financially secure? My whole kind of everything that we've done has always been guided by a really long term purpose. Be, way before purpose became this sort of thing that we must have, I was very lucky that my mentor was a guy called Mike Harris. Uh, Mike Harris convinced Midland Bank to set up. First Direct, which was the first telephone bank. And then in 1998, he convinced Prudential to give him a load of money and set up Egg, which was the first internet bank. And so he, I've known him since 2012. Uh, in fact, I wrote a letter to him with a hundred year vision for Reddington to kind of get on his iconic mentoring course. It's still on, and it's still on my, on my, on my blog. Uh, but yeah, he always, he, the first part of his mentoring was purpose beyond money. He's, and he talks about a game worth playing, win, lose, or draw. And whether it's Reddington, Mallow Street, my charity Red Star, which, which is in, which is amazing, we're going to change the game for 4.7 million young primary school kids because we're going to teach them about money and how it works and help them make less stupid decisions about buy and I pay later, help them get more engaged with their pension and invest in your fund or my fund one day. You know, uh, that's that's really cool, but it starts with it starts with with purpose and you know and now with uh with rebalance earth and both reddington and mallow street are b corps uh so i've got two b corps under my belt and uh you know the intention is that rebalance earth will become a b corp and we, we were talking about boards but we're gonna you should look into this you can actually appoint nature to be on your board as well so we're 
been speaking to some lawyers in Bristol about how can we actually appoint nature uh, on on our board. And I'm, I'm a big believer that you know you can have the biggest impact by being a profit based business because P and L profit and loss is a brutal discipline. It's it's like being tackled on the ground. They just to as I was talking about that wall of death. Uh, that accountability it is ruthless it is relentless but I think being purpose-led gives you that kind of that soul and character of of a charity so if you can live if you can kind of position yourself at, at that point I think that's that's where you can have uh, you can have the biggest impact so yeah so that was Reddington and Mallow Street uh, this opportunity came up at St James's Place the reason why that was interesting at the time they had about 750,000 clients and a hundred billion pounds. When I left, there was a hundred and fifty billion pounds. That's a big old it's number. Breathtaking scale, isn't it? Uh, Just... Yeah, I mean, people don't realise how big a billion is. Just, just to put it in in, in context, you know, uh, if you would count up to a million, it would sort of take you uh, twelve days. But to count to a billion would take you thirty-one years. So 150 billion pounds is an insane amount of money. And I was responsible for that on behalf of, by the end, almost a million clients, some of them who were like less than one years old and quite a few that were over 100 years old. So that opportunity, the opportunity to embed environmental social governance to the world worth living in, uh, incredibly powerful. At the time, I was the youngest FTSE 100 board director. So I was 39, so I was the youngest yeah, board director in the FTSE 100. Uh, I also had the opportunity to position myself potentially one day to be their, their their CEO and just learning what it is to be a listed business with annual results, with equity analysts. We have to meet with shareholders. It, 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 it sort of, you know, it's a different level. I like to play tennis, but it's sort of like going from like club level tennis to certainly Nadal. To, to national, well, not probably not Nadal, but certainly national level before going up. Uh, I mean, obviously, if you're at the very, very top of, you know, if you're Apple or Microsoft, that's that's Nadal, Djokovic level. But and so for me, it was the ultimate. That was my MBA. I was like, I've got nothing. It's a game worth playing when losing or draw. Yeah. Because actually, I went from being a consultant where I advised people on what to do. Where actually, where I was there, the buck stopped with me. Obviously, I had a big team. I had 450 people working for me. So it wasn't that I was doing it. But anything went wrong, it was my name. And if anything did really go wrong, I could you know, get arrested and go to prison. That's what SMCR under the FCA does. And you know, if it was in the press, it was my name in the press. Uh, if you get trolled on the internet, it was my name being trolled. So you know, you're the man in the arena, which is one of my favorite uh, poem. You are the man in the arena. Uh, and yeah, I, I, p people thought I was mad going there cause it sort of didn't really think it was me, but the, the opportunity was amazing. And, uh, and actually what I wanted to do is could I recreate culture at scale? Could I take an existing culture, uh, and change it? It's a lot harder. I'm really wondering, did you change the culture at St. James's place more or less than St. James's place changed you? Uh, I think I I I would like to think I changed it more than it it changed me. Uh, I I don't think my culture of who I am has changed much. I I definitely learned a lot of skills and experience that I would never have had if I'd stayed at Reddington. So in but that that's probably not changed me. It's just given me more skills and experience. If 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 that makes sense. But like if I look back to when I joined and I remember they have this big annual event where they get everyone together at the O2. And I'm the investment direct scale of people there. 7,000 people. Wow. So if you don't like speaking in public, you're not going to like this. No. I mean, this is where rock stars and famous people yeah. play at the O2, right? So you walk out with 7,000 people and you're on stage and for 20 minutes, you've got to walk. I don't like talking with, uh, Teleprompts, and again, they were freaking out. I am awful on script, like, so people I'm dull. Yeah. But, so everyone else is teleprompt, and I, 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 you know, I, I didn't, and I was like, okay, I want to do something different. So I, and I was introducing the idea of financial well-being in a world worth living in. So they were nowhere on sort of ESG and and, and climate change and net zero investing, and we. I was showing the story about being born in Holland. And so we got 
this massive several tons of rice it must have been 10 15 meters high behind me and it was melting as i was talking and in front of me was a profile of sea level rise from amsterdam to like new york and london and the idea is by the time i would finish the talk enough ice would have melted that amsterdam would be underwater so people still remember this talk now come on people just remember the crazy guy with the melting ice i also happened to do a double app with a guy who have a, a big sort of man crush on a guy you probably know who he is lewis pew uh so he'd just come back do. swimming swim in the arctic yeah uh, and so we did a bit of a, a double act to, together between my my talk but really i wanted to introduce this idea of kind of universal asset ownership that you know helping helping someone have a million pound in retirement might feel like a good thing but if there's no coral reefs if we can't drink the water or if there are no bees that's not a world worth living in so this was me sort of presenting my my vision anyway that talk it's funny I'd, i would say you could split the feedback by age between people who are like wow that's the finest talk i've ever heard that's amazing yeah to who on earth is this guy and we just hired greta thunberg in disguise and that we was still that one right that 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 wasn't yeah. a compliment by yeah. the way uh uh th this is into like 2019 2020 uh but i introduced so the the sort of purpose or you know purpose statement of sjp is uh embrace your tomorrow but if you look through on linkedin and see how many sjp financial advisors there's four and a half thousand use some version of financial well-being in a world worth living in that was introduced by me i love how that makes you proud still and you know sjp was the first wealth manager globally to sign up to g fans which was the global uh financial alliance from net zero and i got a lovely email from mark carney actually i wish i kept it because it was to my sjp one but saying oh what well i'm rob what you're doing is the gold standard when it comes uh to to kind of setting uh net zero strategy but when you do that with 150 billion pounds that has real might that you know, yeah that has real real uh uh impact and then you know even now after i've left you know a big part of uh SJP and, and anyone in the financial advice is you need to be recruiting more and more and younger and younger advisors. Uh, and the amount of times I, I, even now I get messaged on LinkedIn by partners saying, oh, you should just know it's such a shame you left. But the reason I came to SJP was because of all of the work that you did. So I definitely appealed to that sort of younger cohort. Uh, and, you know, I know the new CEO who's just started very much thinks that 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 piece sustainability is something that they should be leading on and they were nowhere in in you know five years ago so in that sense i think uh i, th I think i made a big a big difference and and even today a year on people talk about my team that i was responsible for as being the kind of like standout team within the company both in terms of energy in terms of diversity in terms of thought leadership and you know again yeah the guy who's leading that now tom beale uh my successor is amazing and all the rest but you you kind of feel like you had a part in in sort of putting that putting that team together that's amazing so the next chapter na natural capital yeah what does that mean to you yeah natural capital i the, the way i put it is that i coming from the investment world is i think nature is our most valuable asset but we just don't value it it is more valuable than all of the equities all of the amazon and microsoft uh all of the property and all of the bonds and i suppose and i know you've asked this question many times so i just want to give a different answer to the one everyone always gives most of us are taught in our personal financial lives that our house is our kind of it's the financial asset that certainly in the uk you know my home is my castle uh that we want to in that, that we want to invest in but actually planet earth is our home is the home to eight billion people and the way we live our life which you'd never do with your property normally when you buy a house and get out a mortgage you do it up right you invest in it you go down to the diy stock you paint it you invest in it, you make it better well on planet earth we're pulling the we've been turning the rafters we're we're just pulling off the tiles we're destroying the house uh that we live in and so our goal is really simple the only way to help people realize that nature is our most financial valuable financial asset i.e 
the air we breathe, the water we drink, the bees that pollinate, everything that we eat, is if we start paying for nature. Because at the moment, the price of nature is zero, which is yeah. why we just rip it up, like, like we don't, uh, like we don't care. And so, uh, I suppose I'm coming to the same problem that you and your team come at, but I'm really coming from the financial world, although with my geography, hydrology, glaciology background. Yeah. Uh, and the, the, the way I describe it is that most of us use Netflix or Spotify and this kind of idea of freemium. But for the last four billion years, we've been on nature as a service on the freemium model, and we now need to start paying for nature. And we're going to make it an investable asset because actually raising money from pension funds and making that argument is a relatively easy one. And I've heard you made it several times, but you can only make a financial return when someone starts to pay for it. Uh, and and that's, that, that is the most important thing. So, you know, our original idea at Rebalance Earth a year ago, if you'd had us on, was around forest elephants as kind of basically keystone species. How can we take the ecosystem services that a keystone species represents? How can we tokenize it and then take those credits and then sell them back to, to companies? Tried for a year to sell it, Paul Revere style, uh, and really, really struggled. Uh, but the feedback I kept getting over and over again, and it just happened to the people I know were all based in the UK, was actually, what can we do in the UK? Uh, and then I suppose this is where you go full circle. And I lent on what I know, which is rivers. So people don't realize that the flooding we're experiencing in the UK is as a result of climate change. Warmer temperature means more rainfall. But in the UK, only 10% of our rivers are in their natural state. So 90% of our rivers have been altered. And people will remember their GCSE geography when I start to talk about this, but you've got the hydraulic curve. And all the hydraulic curve says is, if I put in a certain amount of water, how quickly does that water move through the catchment? And what is the shape of that? And in COVID, we all remembered flattening the curve. Well, we've done the opposite. We've steepened the curve. So land use change in the UK, straightening our rivers, which we started doing in Victorian times and then did it on steroids in the 1950s, post-World War II, means that water hits our catchment and flood risk goes through the roof. So if you can start to restore rivers at scale, we have restored rivers, but you'll see them, but it's like two kilometers or 500 meters. I know that'll you've restored a, your stream here. That'll be a big restoration project. Yeah, I mean, to restore the Thames is a 16 billion pound opportunity. So people say, is there enough opportunity in the UK? I say, yeah, absolutely. Now, the cool thing about restoring a river is it helps with flood risk. It helps with drought risk. Actually, when you restore a river, you get what's called pools and riffles back and you get insects back. Actually, riparian zones, which is the area around a river, when you straighten them, you strip them of wildlife, you get 30% back. Actually, we know that wetlands are one of the most highest value biodiversity net gain units. And then the second thing, this is like my business mind, is that when we're looking at a landscape, we, we're sort of using a effectively like GIS models. So geographers will use these sort of layered map. Google Maps is basically GIS. You can zoom in and zoom out, and then you can put a restaurant on top or a tube station and go, how do I get from A to B? So we want to know wh where are our river catchments that are sort of degraded? Well, all of them. Uh, where are they flashy? But where is their high value property or where when you map back to a company and they do their sustainability report under TNFD, which is the Task Force for Nature Related Financial Disclosure, do they have a big pain point? Because that we know that people really pay for either where they can make a lot of money or where there's going to be a lot of financial pain. So the River Irwell, that feeds into Manchester, that is a valuable area. So that is a good example. The River Tamar that feeds into Plymouth Again, a third of our cattle comes from that catchment area. Southwest Water needs to spend a fortune on, on water storage. The Environment Agency spends a fortune on dredging. And so we're developing these sort of 25-year nature-as-a-service agreements. And I noticed as we came down, there were a load of wind farms. What enabled renewable energy to take off is what's called power purchasing agreements. They're these kind of long-dated 25-year contracts between two people who say, well, if I provide you electricity, you'll pay me that. Well, we want to do the same, but but for nature. Uh, and so, yeah, our goal is to pay our part in enabling the flow of private capital to protect and restore nature at scale 
here in the UK and that's where our worlds meet because we're we're highly aligned in in trying to make that happen and it's it's so exciting I remember when you first gave me a call and said uh we're, we're going to this is going to be I was so so excited because we need so many people trying to build the natural capital economy in so many different ways and I think um you and I have talked before about being aligned on the base of it's it's not about growing our respective businesses it's about growing that economy full stop because there's so many people out there trying to damage the planet and not enough trying to fix it no, 100%. I mean, just specifically on this point more than ever, but even in, whether it was in Reddington or Mallet Street, I always think competition's a good thing. Competition raises the bar for everyone. Hopefully you produce a better product or service for your clients. On this thing, the biggest competition is that we don't value nature. You know, we need to, I mean, DEFRA wants a billion pound a year flowing into that. I mean, uh, Finance Earth have said it's sort of like north of 50 billion, 50 billion pounds over the next seven years to 2030. I actually think that number is bigger. I think it's it's probably more like 70 billion pounds. And you know, I mean, you you probably had the biggest impact over the last two years. But we, I mean, we we haven't even started. Uh, and so actually, the the more businesses like ours really holding the candle and winning the argument, both bottom up and top down that actually this is not only the smart thing to do, but the only way if, if we're going to kind of survive on, on planet Earth uh, is, is exactly what we need to do. And, and, and human human behavior is their safety in numbers, actually. So if, if people hear it enough times from multiple people, and, and it's not just us in this space, right, then, then actually people go, well, actually, they've probably got a point. So that, so that was one of the questions, actually. So wearing a couple of your old hats, we've got a huge amount of investment advisors out there that will be hearing... So pension funds, we, we hear all the time, I want to get into natural capital, I want to get into natural capital. Often because the people making the investment decisions, their kids and grandkids have said, you totally need to do this, you need to get in. But then you've got a group of investment advisors whose job it is to, to, to make sure people are careful and secure and not take risks. How do we upscale them enough so they're comfortable with uh, taking that bet on the future? Uh, to, to be fair, I think a lot of you know, a lot of them are. I mean, over the last year, I, I probably, one of the things that surprised me was how many of my old competitors from the Runnington days wanted me to come in and talk to them and understand what I'm and I'm, I'm up to. Uh, I, I, I actually think on this subject, a lot of people want to learn about it. The million dollar question or the million pound question is, if this pension fund invests 25 million pound or 100 million pound, how do I make money from nature? Yeah. So it, it's that connectivity it's that duality of, okay, I can see that this is good for the environment, but show to me that this will make a financial return. Because the moment that we crack that, then it becomes a no-brainer. And, you know, to put it in context, if you take all of the kind of pension fund and say long-term saving assets in the UK, so defined benefit pension funds, defined contribution, which is going to be the future, local authority pension funds, private pensions like the ones that you know we used to manage at SJP that's about five trillion pounds in the UK so a two percent allocation to natural capital you know that gets you to a hundred billion pounds and I think that's doable in the next you know inside the next 10 years so the I don't think anyone's questioning the positive impact on nature Obviously, the challenge is that this isn't a liquid asset and you need, you know, you, I say to you know, BNG is a 30 year thing, right? So, you know, let's not rush, let's get it right. Uh, and, you know, and hopefully beyond 30 years as well. Uh, but the, 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 the real, real question is when we can get the water companies, when we can get our food and beverage companies, when we do get, Diageo and Nestle, not investing a few million pounds in the projects that you kind of read about, but investing hundreds of millions of pounds because they see this as core infrastructure for the long-term success and vitality of their businesses. Yeah. Once that happens, then people will start to see natural capital as a natural infrastructure asset in the same way that we see pylons or roads or, or roads as, as, as infrastructure assets. And to me, that's the tipping point, the point where a farmer goes, well, Actually, if I'm making money from my land, whether I'm doing it to create biodiversity net gain or if I'm doing it to create food, at least for me economically, I should be indifferent to that point. And I, I don't think we've crossed that point. When we do, this market will tip.
And do you think the sort of more complex products, the derivatives of this world are going to have a role to play in the natural capital economy? I think derivatives just are part of a maturing financial market uh, that, that grows. But I mean, you know, people have talked about property derivatives and that's that's not really ever taken off. But property is arguably the largest sort of asset class on, 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 on this planet. Uh, so it, it potentially has a role. I think the, the more interesting role is normally, again, if you, if you think about when you buy a house, you have your mortgage, which in, sort of, in my word is that that's your equity. You're taking a lot of risk and then you borrow money, you get debt. And I think the interesting thing is when businesses like yours and mine are that equity layer to get things going, but then we can get the UK infrastructure bank or we can get insurance companies to come in and provide debt. So instead of doing a hundred million, we start doing a billion. Instead of doing a billion, we start to do 10 billion. That is, that's the game changer. That's we need to we, 10X and a hundred X. I'm so excited about the deal we did with Triodos to, to yeah. put together the first commercial debt package on conservation that was linked to, to carbon credits. And we're in a fortunate position where we didn't have to do that debt package. We could have bought land without it, but we wanted to show that was possible and to put that first stake in the ground, that this is something people can point to and work to. And we know others in this space who are now having conversations of their own say, can we leverage what we're doing to achieve more? So I think you're absolutely right. In in the years to come, we will we will see more of that. Um, and so, and I, I 100% agree, we need exemplars. And that is a brilliant exemplar because it's so much easier to kind of copy and improve what's already been done than when people can't see it. So the, the value of what you did with Chirdos is, 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 is priceless because it shows people there's a way. That's awesome. That's a useful point for me to say thank you to, to Phil and Simon and Bevis and Maverick out there for making that possible. So thank you. Um, so uh, you, you kindly commented on a, on a piece I released at the start of 2024 about my 15 ideas and trends for we'd see natural capital in 2024. What, what are the key ones for you that you, you want to see or, or think we will see? Uh, the, the one that I want to see is a sizable payment for a nature-related ecosystem service that isn't carbon. Yeah. That that for me, and you know, obviously this year, you know, hopefully BNG goes live in 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 February. You know, if we start to see some real volume go go through that, that'd be great. But I'd love to see, you know, someone like a Tesco or an M and S or a co-op do something quite quite innovative. Uh, again, to kind of build on on what you did with with triodos and then you know somewhat uh you know specifically to my fund i would love to do a river restoration at proper scale and show that we can not only unlock all of the value that i mentioned but also that's a massive climate change flood mitigation uh and and go from the amazing work that all of our rivers trusts do i mean you mentioned earlier about the challenge of these trusts is that they're living hand to mouth no one's ever come along and said well what if we had 25 million pounds to restore a river well the, the only place we saw that was um the uh, shad project on the river seven in worcester that resulted in seven different or more than that fish passages that unlocked a huge section and that was very specific engineered solutions yeah. not full restoration and we're still iconic in terms of what it was able to achieve so um, the, the last project Dan and I, our head of environment, worked on before we uh, left our previous company to, to come and start auction conservation, we restored 500 metres of uh, Pendle water in, in the northwest, which had been a, uh, in the 60s, the council literally blocked off the river, poured concrete down a gravel bed river so the sewerage outfall would go past it faster. So we literally took out concrete from the bed of the river, reinstalled the riffle pull sequences in the gravel bed of the, of the channel. And um, at the time, it was the biggest restoration project that had been done there. So I, I love that you're going to pick up that baton and and take it on since we're, we haven't got wet feet anymore. We're more <laughs> on the hills. Um, and, and what about you personally, Rob, for 2024? Is, is there anything on the bucket list that you're like, me and the family are definitely going to do this in, in 24? Well, we just, we, we uh, the bucket list was probably last year. We just, uh, I took my family to South Africa and on safari, which was just mind, mind blowing. Uh, this year we're in 11 plus mode so i just need to be a good dad and help my daughter through her exams that seems to be the 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 the, the priority i think you know just enjoy my, my biggest challenge is the the downside of that work hard mentality is i could just go all in on rebalance earth yeah uh and you know to make sure that i'm also a good husband and a good dad that's that's a really uh 
important goal for me. So if I can do all of the things I want to do professionally and career-wise uh, and do that, then that'll be an amazing 2024. Amen to that. Rob, Thank I've wanted to do this for years. Thank you so much for making the time to come and be part of the shoot room. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Well, thanks, Rich, and best of luck to you and the team. And, yeah, let's make this market happen. Thank you. Cheers, guys.